Dear friends, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Many people do not know this, um, but Ole and Sven were two of the biggest baseball fans that the world had ever known. They traveled to all of the major league ballparks and they watched the game on television and they listened to the sports jockeys on the radio for 80 plus years. They shared the love of the game and made a pact that whoever went to heaven first would return to earth as an angel and tell the other if there was baseball in heaven or not. Well, the day came and Sven died peacefully in his sleep one night and went to heaven where he played his first night of baseball with his old buddies in one of the most beautiful stadiums he had ever seen. The next day, he returned to Oli's bedside in the morning and woke him up to tell him everything he had experienced during the night. Oli asked, is there baseball up there, Sven? To which Sven replied, well, Oli, I've got some good and bad news on that one. Yes, there is baseball, and that's the good news. Well, what's the bad news, Sven? They've scheduled you to pitch tomorrow night. (laughs) Now, our gospel text this morning says nothing about baseball, but in this parable, we get a stark contrast between heaven and hell, but not only the contrast between heaven and hell, but between two men who end up there. Now, if you were to read this gospel text to, say, a thousand Americans and take a survey afterwards, how might you expect that they would answer the question, why did the rich man end up in hell and not in heaven? I would surmise that a fair amount of them would say that he ended up in hell because he neglected the poor, because he was mean to poor Lazarus and didn't share his food with him. Some might tell you that the rich man ended up in hell because He had many possessions, and he should have shared all that he had with people. Across the eons of time, we have painted the concept of getting into heaven through jokes, that before you can go and play on the heavenly baseball team or walk the streets of gold, you first might have to get past St. Peter and his barrage of questions. Maybe St. Peter would whip out your financial portfolio and see how generous you were. Maybe St. Peter would drudge up some past injustices and take you to task. Maybe you'd have to answer a riddle or two. But here's where the funniest pearly gate stories fall short. They all put the emphasis on you. St. Peter whips out his scale in these jokes to weigh your good and your bad deeds. So we have a bunch of punchlines about lawyers and politicians never getting into heaven, right? And somehow, this way of looking at our entrance into heaven has bled over into our theology. So when we read this parable of Jesus, we immediately try to identify where we fit in. Are we the rich man, or are we poor Lazarus? And where is the cutoff? Sure, I have some possessions, and I have some money in the bank, and I have some investments, but I'm not a millionaire. Our problem is that we want Jesus to whip out his measuring stick and show us where the poverty line is because when we hear this parable, we assume two things. One, being wealthy means you will go to hell and being poor means you will go to heaven. So we start rifling through our closets to see how much purple we own, like the rich man. We start holding ourselves up against Bill Gates and we go, now there's a rich man, Jesus. I mean, I don't have dogs licking my wounds, and I'm not begging for scraps from the table, but I'm not rich, so there's room in heaven for me, right? Dear friends in Christ, the contrast between these two men are startling. One rich, one poor, one full, one begging. One had a great life, the other had a hard life. But both of the men met the final reality that awaits all of us. Death came knocking. And I don't care if you have $1 million in the bank or $1 in the bank. I don't care if you've never worked a day in your life or if you've suffered through every moment of it. I don't care if you have cars and homes and a Swiss bank account or if you have a shoebox with a few dollars hidden underneath your bed. We will all die. And here's the spoiler. What you received in this life 
how much money you have in the bank, your occupation, your success, your status, your place in the social pecking order, either high or low, none of these things are indication of God's judgment over you in the life to come. Do you know how I know that? Because when the rich man, lying in hell, gawked up into heaven and saw Lazarus, do you know who Lazarus was sitting by? Abraham. And Abraham was one of the richest men in the Old Testament. Go back and read through Genesis 12 and 13. When we meet Abraham, it is recorded that he owns sheep and donkeys and camels and servants and livestock and silver and gold and a great number of possessions. Well, this is a head-scratcher, isn't it? Here we have a rich man being tormented in the pits of hell and a rich man, Father Abraham himself, enjoying the everlasting and blessed peace of heaven. So what gives? What's the difference? The difference is this. Abraham was rich, but I'm not talking about worldly rich. Abraham was rich because God had given him a promise. God had taken Abram and turned him into Abraham and given him a promise that he would have an heir and many more heirs to come. And those heirs would number a nation so great that they would be as innumerable as the stars and this family would be a blessing to the world and not only would they inherit a land to call their own, but from their ranks, from their family line, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah himself would raise himself up and save God's people from their sin. We are fooling ourselves into thinking that we are saved because of our poverty or condemned because of our wealth when our entrance through the gates of heaven is not based on our ability to answer St. Peter's riddles, is not based on a scale that measures our good and our bad works, but rather our entrance through the gates of heaven is based on the promise of Christ alone. And this is what separates the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man knows nothing of, wants nothing to do with, and has little time for Christ's promise of forgiveness of eternal life. His comfort and his identity is completely wrapped up in his happiness and his possessions, his success, as fleeting as these things of the world are. Lazarus, on the other hand, knows that despite begging in the gutter, that despite having only the dogs that are licking his wounds to call friends, that God's promises last forever and that God is faithful and God provides. And suddenly, the rich man comes to a startling realization. The chasm cannot be crossed. It's too late for him. The bridge between heaven and hell is closed. And this is the true agony of hell, being cut off from God completely, without a word of hope, without a word of promise. The agony and the terror of hell is knowing that your fine possessions, your job, the very identity you wrap yourself up in on earth is of no use to you. So the rich man wants to save at least his brothers, who are following in his footsteps. Certainly there is still a way to save them from the dungeon of despair. He said, send them an unbelievable sign to wake them up. Send Lazarus from the dead to appear before my brothers and warn them. But sadly, Abraham knows the truth. If they have not been changed by God's word, the word that has been handed down through Moses and the prophets, a resurrected Lazarus will do absolutely nothing for them. Because you see, if we know nothing of the word, we will know nothing of God's power, which is revealed through the word. Through the word that was handed down through Moses and Abraham and Isaiah and the prophets of the Old Testament, because each one of these men, each one of them bore witness to one thing and one thing only, that one day the Messiah would appear to be the savior of men. Abraham says to the rich man, they have these words, so let them hear them. Let them hear that even though we are sinners, in the waters of holy baptism, we are made children of God. Let them 
here that in those waters, not only did we receive a name as God's beloved, but we received a promise that nothing would separate us from the love of God we have in Christ Jesus. Let them hear that in the bread and the wine that we are about to partake in, we are strengthened, that the promise first given in baptism is given again in the Lord's Supper. Let them hear that our place in heaven cannot be purchased, that our place in heaven is not a reward for good behavior, but rather our name is written in the book of life only because Jesus Christ wrote it there with his blood. Dear hearers of God's holy word, you need not ask which one of these men of the parable you are. Ask not what you need to do to inherit God's kingdom. Let them hear. Hear it for yourself. God's promises are yours. And God's promises are all you'll need in this life and in the life to come. Amen.